Just a, a bit of information. I wasn't sure how much this crowd would actually know about the poultry industry. It is what we call a vertic vertically integrated industry in that most of the companies, 90% of the chicken, and I use that term, please don't quote me on that, but that would be my best guess, that at least 90% of the chickens produced in this country are produced through vertically integrated uh, companies. Companies own the breeders, which would be the parent stock. They own the eggs, they own the hatcheries, they own the broilers, they own the feed mills, the feed, the live haul, transportation of the birds back and forth to the plant, and the processing plants. So as such, there are certain advantages that go with that, uh, with vertical integration, and that would be complete process control. Our growers are not at liberty to add anything to our feed. They're not at liberty to add any uh, antibiotics or any medications. Uh, their only part in this is to provide the housing and to provide the housing and the environment that the birds are raised in. So that creates some opportunities. It also creates some challenges, which I'll address before we get off of this. Uh, but the other point that I wanted you to know before we dig too deeply into this, that whether you're raising birds in a traditional uh, poultry production, uh, which my company happens to participate in, or uh, if you're leaning more towards the race without antibiotics to fulfill a market niche that the customers, uh, consumers have been demanding, our goal is really the same. And, and that in part might be the reason why there's such a consistency of message in this room as I've been sitting here listening to talks in the last, last couple of days. And that is that we, we do not want to use antibiotics if we don't have to. Uh, as John Glisson pointed out this morning, I think it was uh, Dr. John Glisson mentioned that, you know, for, for a human to go to a physician and receive a script for an antibiotic, that's, that's a payment to the, to the, to the physician. Uh, for the veterinary side of it, if we have to write a script, then that's a cost to the company. So we look at any, any script that we have to write, we look at any medication that we have to give the birds as a cost, and we don't want to do that without the need being fulfilled that we're trying to address. So we try to do that minimally, and we try to do that responsibly when we have to do it. So why an interest in stewardship, even in traditional programs or conventional program like Sanderson Farms is involved in, where we have no, made no claims about antibiotic-free or raised without antibiotics or no antibiotics ever? And, and I would argue that, that veterinarians have an obligation to use these products appropriately as, designed, as defined by the veterinary oath. I graduated from vet school in 1984, and the oath that I took said that I was interested in the protection of animal health and welfare, the prevention and relief of animal suffering, but I'm also interested in the promotion of public health. So I find myself as a veterinarian, and that's most of my comments today are going to be addressed to the veterinarians in, in the audience. As a veterinarian, I find myself in the unique position of, of having to decide when to treat flocks, but also to be concerned about public health. So we're right at the forefront of this, and, and we're right in the middle of it, whether we want to be or not. We have those two sides of the coin that we have to look at in every scenario that we have to deal with. Uh, we must use with caution the products that we have available because there, there really are uh, very few products in the pipeline. Uh, the most recent antibiotic that was introduced, I think, was just this year, avilomycin. Uh, yes, we got a new antibiotic, but guess what? The rest of the world has had it since, I believe, 1987. So it's taken a long time to bring that product to the United States, and it's brought to the United States with such limitations that it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, uh, for many people in poultry production to utilize, just because we have to fit it into a program in a very specified position. It's just going to make it very difficult. Uh, additionally, we're losing products that, we've, that we currently had through uh, consumer and economic pressure in many cases rather than regulatory action. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples of interactions that I've had in, in the past two months, I've, I've, been, I've been to visit two different uh, restaurant chains, both of which are interested in either no antibiotics ever or raised without antibiotics or something along that line. And I was curious to know what drove, what motivated them that direction. What, what is the basis for that decision? The first comment that was made in both situations, before we even sat down at the table to discuss the situation was, you have to realize that this decision was made with absolutely no science in mind whatsoever. This is the result of our consumer surveys. And then they would pull out the consumer surveys, which stated that antibiotic use was at the top of their list. But it also stated that number two on their list in both situations was animal welfare. So again, we find ourselves in that difficult position between is it the right thing to do for the animal? Is it the right thing to do for, for a consumer that may or may not totally understand this very complex situation, this very complex issue? I, I don't mean to belittle the consumer's uh, uh, knowledge or information base around this, but it, it's a very complex situation for, for scientists to wrap their heads around. There's very little agreement in the scientific community. You can argue, argue both sides of this, these points. Uh, so. 
the point is decisions are being made in some cases with little or no science involved in the decision whatsoever. Pharmaceutical companies, in an effort to, to meet the demands that they have for shifting, uh, or shifting their production towards the antibiotic-free or the chemical uh, anticoccidial programs that uh, Dr. Glisson mentioned this morning, Instead of ionophores, which cannot be used in a race without antibiotic programs, they're shifting it towards chemical production. The result of that is other products that would be available to us as antibiotics are no longer available. Um, we're, heading into, we're heading into this winter when I expect that uh, bronchitis viruses will create challenges in the birds that will be followed by secondary bacterial infections with little to nothing to use against uh, E. coli type infections. And thirdly, I wanted to mention just a, an experience that I had this summer at the AVMA, American Veterinary Medical Association meeting. I went to a, a morning semi, uh, seminar, uh, mini seminar for the turkey uh, industry on blackhead disease in turkeys. Uh, blackhead disease is a protozoal disease uh, that affects both, affects broiler breeders as well as turkeys, but it's devastating for the turkey industry. And one of the problems is that either by regulation or voluntary withdrawal of NADAs, uh, there are virtually no products available for treating blackhead in turkeys, this protozoal disease. At one time, we used uh, organic arsenicals or ipronidazole. Both products have been withdrawn. There's really nothing left. There's no product left for treating blackhead in turkeys. Uh, and, and the message was there among the turkey industry, it was, it was tear jerking, actually. The message was, the mortality in turkey flocks that break with blackhead is 85%. The 15% that survive, they're having to put down because they can't afford to bring them into the processing plant. One, one of my colleagues from the Minnesota area stood up and said, this is hard to believe, but he said, in the last year, I've put down more flocks for blackhead disease than I ever put down for avian influenza. It's a devastating disease, and it was a reminder to me, for whatever reason, those products are not available. I'm not arguing whether those products should be available or not, but it was a reminder to me of what can happen if we find ourselves in a situation where we inadvertently throw away products that have been scientifically vetted and proven to be safe and efficacious, that's the take-home message that I had from that meeting. <clears throat> My perspective on judicious antibiotic use is, is that if we fail to treat when necessary, then that contributes to animal welfare issues. And I don't care whether you're in a conventional, or traditional uh, uh, growing program or a race without antibiotic program. If you have flocks of chickens or turkeys, they are going to get sick. And when they get sick, you need to have the opportunity to treat those flocks. Now, several of my colleagues in the raised without antibiotic uh, uh, industry or raised without antibiotic marketplace have told me that they've been given permission to treat whenever, whenever flocks reach a certain level of mortality. Uh, in fact, they're encouraged to treat. Uh, but, but that level is probably considerably higher than the level at which others that aren't under those same constraints might decide to treat. Is that right or wrong? I don't know. It's just a, it's a difficult position for a veterinarian to be put in. And I can tell you that when, when the market is tight and they're having, to make, they're having to meet a certain number of pounds of product going out the door uh, and, and it needs to be antibiotic free, the pressure is going to be on that veterinarian not to treat those flocks that should have been treated. And, and that gets back to the veterinary oath. I have been fortunate enough not to be put in that situation, but I've had discussions with veterinary colleagues that have been in that situation. And it's a frustrating, very frustrating situation to feel like you're violating your veterinary oath in order to meet a market demand. Food safety, I don't know what the answer is on food safety. In, in the back of my mind, there's risk to running <coughs> antibiotics on product that's going to go to the processing plant, but there's also risk on bringing birds in that could have been treated effectively in the field in time to have antibiotic withdrawal. And, and essentially bring in healthier flocks to the processing plant, minimizing food safety risk. Is the data there to support that? I don't know. Sustainability of agriculture is certainly a concern. Uh, if, if we continue to throw away technology and not use technology that's available, there's no doubt that the inefficiencies inherent in a race without antibiotic program are going to lead to a bigger carbon <coughs> footprint. It takes more houses. It takes more birds. It takes more fecal material. It takes more nesting material. Uh, it takes more water. It, it's a very inefficient way to raise birds at a time when the world demand for protein, you heard earlier today, I think is expected to rise by uh, 100% by, by uh, two uh, 2050, I think was the, the date that was mentioned. So stewardship, how do we do it? And I think, again, this is where, uh, this is where <coughs> veterinarians, regardless of whether they work for a raised without antibiotics or no antibiotics ever or a tradition more traditional program like I'm more familiar with, this is where we all have things in common. 
And, and I would point down to the, to the bottom line here, the two documents that are our guiding principles. I'll just mention those first, and then we'll come up and address the, the key elements at the top of this slide. The two documents that provide the guiding principles for us in avian medicine are produced by the American Association of Avian Pathologists and the AVMA, a uh, paper titled Guidelines for Ju Judicious Therapeutic Use of Antimicrobials in Poultry. And there's also an, an American Association of Avian Pathologists paper uh, entitled The Positions on Judicious Use of Drugs Fed to Poultry and the Risks to Human Health. Both those documents outline the things that we're interested in doing with regard to being good stewards of the products that we have. Uh, and paramount in that is veterinary oversight and the diagnosis and treatment of all of our birds. Uh, I would say in every case, even with over-the-counter drugs in, in our particular company, which I can speak to more than, more than others in the industry, but I would say others in the industry are not that different from what we do. Uh, any, any flock that gets treated with even an over-the-counter antibiotic in, in the past <clears throat> year has required a script on our part. Not required by law, but internally we've required that. We're getting used to the fact that that's going to happen January 1st, so we're preparing ourselves for that. Uh, diagnostics, including culture and sensitivity before starting antibiotic regimes. Uh, we do this immediately. As soon as we see a problem that we think is going to warrant uh, uh, an antibiotic, we get birds to the lab. We do uh, culture and sensitivity. Uh, we also uh, will begin water acidifiers usually, and sometimes that's enough. We'll start birds on water acidifiers if we can keep the water lines clean of any biofilm. Sometimes that will take the, the, the requirement out for, for an antibiotic. But the big thing that we do is for any disease that we script any product for, we go back to the farm and we say, okay, disease situation, was there a management factor involved in this? Was there something that we could have done to prevent this so that we don't have to treat this flock again in the future? We want to fully understand with the grower present things that happened, things that could have happened differently to avoid the use of antibiotics in the first place. That's been our approach. And I think that, by and large, speaks to the entire poultry industry. Uh, use of management practices to reduce the need for antibiotics. Uh, vaccination programs are, uh, again, paramount in that. Uh, a lot of our diseases are secondary to viral infections. Uh, we do not use the antibiotics for the viral infections, but E. coli typically follows any sort of respiratory virus infection. So we're always on the lookout for that. Uh, but we want to have our vaccination programs designed to uh, address the needs of the challenge in that area, which is a difficult, it's much more difficult than it might seem. Dr. John Glisson reported this morning that, that uh, bronchitis virus is constantly mutating and constantly changing. So we're constantly getting virus isolations to make sure that the vaccine that we're using is either A, not contributing to the disease, or B, is protecting for the challenges that we have in the field. Uh, litter replacement programs, density, downtime between flocks it is always a trade-off between sustainability of, of agriculture and, and what the disease challenges in the birds. Uh, we've learned a lot from our colleagues that have decided to go antibiotic-free. And again, our position, even though we're a traditional uh, program, our position is not to use antibiotics if we don't have to. So we have been increasing our downtime, decreasing our density to try and improve that. Uh, is there more that we can do? It's, it's going to be a constant balance, quite possibly, between sustainability. What, what can the grower afford to do? What can we afford to do and, and still be able to be a sustainable agricultural commodity? Uh, management practices must be sustainable to be environmentally acceptable. Uh, how, how often you clean out poultry houses and what does, an, what does that carbon footprint, when you have to clean out after every flock, do you clean out once a year? How often is the appropriate time to clean out? And finally, biosecurity, which is why I'm a little disappointed so many of you raised your hands since you've been in a chicken house. Uh, critical to reduce the introduction of pathogens on our farms. I've been through an intensive training program the last two weeks and have one more week to go next week where we are training not just all of our, our technical support within our company, we're training every grower and every farm manager that works for every grower in every operation that we have. Now that's being driven largely by avian influenza scare. Uh, and, and as a result of the avian influenza outbreak, we've realized that as an industry, uh, we may have done a poor job of, of training our farm hands, our farm help, to, to the biosecurity practices. So we have a 14-point uh, biosecurity plan that was put together by NPIP. Uh, we have taken that and we have basically a five-page document that, again, all of our growers are trained on and we expect all of their help to be trained on before they're allowed into the chicken house. Whoops. I think that was it. Can we go to the last slide? 
challenges moving forward. What, that was one of the things that was suggested of all the speakers as we come in, with, that we talk a little bit about what concerns us most about the future. And, and I think, as a veterinarian, the thing that concerns me most is our ability to treat sick flocks with the increasing pressures towards going 100% antibiotic-free and, and how that correlates to animal welfare issues. Uh, again, as a veterinarian, the, the veterinary oath was very important to me. I, and I think if I ever get to the point where I don't feel like I can treat a sick flock uh, because, I, because it's meeting some sort of a, a retail market, then that's the day I retired the second time from this, from this job. So uh, that to me is a critical factor. I, I, as a veterinarian, I have to insist upon the opportunity if there's a, a drug that's been shown to be safe and efficacious and I can document that I'm using it judiciously, then I expect to have that, that right and that opportunity. Uh, but to all my veterinary colleagues, we're going to be in the hot seat. We're going to be thrust right into the middle of this decision in, in every case that, that we have to deal with. Uh, unique to the poultry industry is, is our inability to treat individual birds. You know, I, I mentioned at the beginning that the vertical integrated industry gives us unique advantages. The disadvantage is we can't really stop to treat an individual bird. Surprisingly, the general public thinks we do this. They think we pick up birds and inject them with antibiotics. Uh, I told one concerned consumer who called in, I said, we put out 10.5 million birds a week. I said, I don't have time to pick up those birds and inject them with antibiotics. So we have a lot of education to do, but... Uh, but the challenge that we have with regard to the unique nature of a, vertigrate, a vertically integrated industry is we have to treat each house almost as if you would treat each cow. Uh, we just can't separate out individual, individual birds to treat. Uh, who should make the decisions about what products are available to use in animal agriculture? My big concern, my big fear is that we have, up until this point in my life, I've been very satisfied with the fact that the Food and Drug Administration scientifically vets every product that is uh, permitted for use as safe and efficacious. I find great, I find great uh, relief in knowing that there's a great deal of concern that goes into that. Uh, somebody talked earlier about uh, the hundreds of millions of dollars that goes from identification of a molecule to the point at which it can be marketed uh, as an antibiotic. That's expensive and it takes a long time, but again, I find value in that scientific vetting. What I don't find so much value in is the marketing manager of a fast food chain deciding what products I can and cannot use, particularly when they might have no idea or they might tell me right up front it has nothing to do with science. That bothers me as a veterinarian because everything I, everything I do has to do with science. So I, I need to have that to, to anchor myself to. Uh, consumer education is critical to, to avoid throwing away products with demonstrated safety and efficacy. Um, that's paramount on all of us. I don't know the best way to do that. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some questions about that. We've been doing increasingly, uh, we've been increasing the work that we're doing with, uh, with uh, advertising. It, it's, it's such a hard, complex issue to talk about in an advertisement. Uh, we've tried to differentiate between raised without antibiotics and no antibiotic residues. Uh, it's amazing the kind of response that gets from the general public. I get, to see the, I get to see the good and I get to see the negative comments. You would be surprised at what some people believe. Um, we're also, we also invited a, a, a dozen food bloggers to come into our operation. We showed them everything from the hatchery to a feed mill to the, to the uh, a breeder house to a broiler house to the processing plant, thinking that these dozen food bloggers would walk away with nothing but negative things to say. We were making ourselves vulnerable. Uh, as a result of that, every one of them, I can't think of any one of them, I started reading their blogs afterwards, none of them made any comments to the negative. All of them said, in fact, ten of them said before that that they fully anticipated that that, that visit was going to result in, in them recommending to their, to their blog receivers not to eat poultry at all. In fact, every one of them said emphatically just the opposite. So those kind of educational campaigns do pay off. Um, <coughs> And finally, my, my, my last two concerns there, more products are being introduced into the raised without antibiotics market without scientific vetting. You know, a lot of these things like uh, essential oils of oregano or, or you name the product, there, there are hundreds of them that come across my desk requesting appointments, uh, many of them positioning themselves as, uh, as, as flavoring agents or, or whatever that just happens to be pretty good for, uh, for uh, activity against bacteria. Uh, you know, I, I think these products are not vetted. Uh, I have some concerns over some of them, and, and I just, uh, 
I prefer the traditional manner of going through the Food and Drug Administration. Sustainability of animal agriculture in the United States is, is my last concern. Uh, I think we have a growing worldwide demand for poultry. As I said, by 2050, they're expecting protein demand to be twice what it is today. Uh, fish can do that. Uh, chicken can do that. Maybe cattle and swine can do it. We can all fill a niche in that. But we're not going to do it with any more arable uh, land. We're using all the agricultural land we have. And we're not going to do it if, if we throw away technology. If we return to the 1950s way of raising chickens or raising cattle or raising swine, there's going to be a lot of hungry people in the world. And I'll just close with a quote from uh, Ashley, uh, uh, Ashley uh, Peterson at NCC. Heard her give a talk recently, and, and she said, you know, she said, she quoted a Chinese proverb, actually. She said, a man with a full stomach has many problems. A man with an empty stomach has only one problem.